Hi, this is Michael Waits, and welcome back to This Month Amplified. Is this May 2024 Amplified, David? Yeah, it is. <laughs> I was talking to somebody today before we get into this thing. So David Gritz, a co-founder and managing director of InsureTech New York, is back with us at Always. And I always tell David, this is one of my favorite recordings of the month. And I was doing a prep call today, David, with you know, the PR representatives of some CEO of some big, important company. And they were like, look, we had this conversation in December of last year. And I was like, oh, that was just like a month or two ago. <laughs> like, it didn't seem that far away. And then later in the same conversation, he referenced it as like six months ago. And I'm like, December was, yeah, it was six months ago. Wow. Anyway, I don't want to get into this like it's already May or it's already June thing, but it's good to have you back. How are you? I'm doing great. You know, uh, glad to be on the show. I feel like this, you know, monthly milestone just gives me a chance to reflect like that old uh, MTV show, which was like, this is the best week ever, best week ever. This is kind of like was last month, the best month ever. <laughs> I mean, it always is. I'm not kidding, though, when I say this, like, I actually really look forward to this recording with you. I feel honored to have you on every month because you like, first of all, you and I live in completely different places. And I get the sense that you look at things in a way that like, I just haven't learned how to look at yet. Like your analytical <laughs> mind is just way better than mine at some level. Oh, uh, appreciate it. And, you know, I think from my perspective, it's always good to know from a firsthand experience what's happening in Asia, especially on the tech side, because very little amount of that information gets filtered into the US. So I did I did a recording with somebody. It's got to be a month ago now from Germany, and I'm struggling to remember his name. But so please forgive me. He was a really great guy. And he runs a podcast there. And he does it both in German and in English. And he recorded with me and he had all these like ideas about what was going on in Asia. And by the time it was, he was done, he was like, uh, I think like everything you said to me was not ex what I expected at all. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's kind of true. Okay. Let's jump into some of this stuff. It was recently, re so, so Biden talks a lot about the CHIPS Act, right? And I actually did a recording with someone named Liza Lin who wrote a book. I want to see if I can remember what the name of that book was that she wrote. Um, yes, yeah, so The Surveillance State, so Inside China's Control of Blah, Blah, Blah. Really good book. She, she's a Wall Street Journal reporter, and she wrote it with another Wall Street Journal reporter. And one of the main parts of this conversation that she and I had, this was on the Asia Tech podcast, everybody should go listen to that episode with Liza Lin, was that I think the Biden administration and maybe even the Trump administration had stopped sending kind of like high-level chips even phone chips to China for national security reasons, which was one of the reasons why, like, does Huawei even make phones anymore? I don't know. So they what's going do, on and this? I actually heard that they are starting to make cars, but that was, you know, a few years ago, one of the big issues, which was around Huawei not getting access to the chips they need to be yeah. successful. And yep. there was actually a limitation of them being able to use Android, the operating system. So they had to essentially rebuild their own operating system. Yeah. And I think there was some ban on the phone switches because they were competing with Cisco and some other US companies making phone switches and they were just like banned from the United States. She made this whole point that like China doesn't know at least up until now. So Taiwan, obviously, TSMC, right? Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, like they can make the most sophisticated chips in the world. And a lot of the chips that are designed by companies in the United States are built by TSMC, either in Taiwan or somewhere else. But the China doesn't have access to any of this technology and hasn't developed it themselves. So what is going on? They introduced this $47 billion big fund three. This is their largest ever semiconductor investment fund. But is that even a big number anymore? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, if you look at all the, the big numbers for real estate, for infrastructure, for the US CHIPS Act, you know, theoretically, it's not that big of a number because yeah. just you look at the cost of building a foundry from scratch and it's anywhere between five and $10 billion. So theoretically, you're saying, you know, this is, you know, between five and 10 foundries. And, you know, foundry is pretty substantial in terms of its output capability. But if you're trying yep. to, you know, overwhelm Korea, or you're trying to overwhelm Taiwan or the US, you know, it's meaningful, but you're not, you know, break the bank type of opportunity. But also, isn't this more R&D focused, right? Like, so building a foundry, obviously, very difficult to do and a very sophisticated thing. 
Actually, when I was in college over the summer, I worked at a chip manufacturing plant that I've actually been in a clean room. I was, you'll love this, David. <laughs> this is actually true. I was living in upstate New York in Poughkeepsie, and there was a company up there called Tau Labs. And my job that summer was being a janitor at Tau Labs. So I had to like clean the clean rooms and clean everything there. It was kind of cool. Anyway. Nice. Yeah, I guess my closest connection to chips directly is, you know, uh, my first job out of college at Computer Aid, one of our clients was a company called Analog Devices. Yep. And, um, you know, most people think about chips and computers, which are all digital. But believe it or not, you know, before the 60s, most computer systems were analog. And analog computers actually have a huge advantage over digital computers in the way that they use power. And yep. also for... Um, one of the most difficult things that computers have to do, which is signal processing. So think about all the things that, you know, machine vision does and, um, you know, processing radar and, and LIDAR. When there was much less compute power, we had to use analog devices. And there is this mathematical term called a fast Fourier transfer, which not to go into uh, math on this podcast, but essentially Good. it's the process of taking signals that are, you know, different amplitudes and different wavelengths and um, adding or subtracting them together. And you could imagine in radar, it makes a lot of sense that you need to do that because you have all kinds of interference and you need to find, you know, the individual plane in the sky or, you know, the individual submarine in the water. And the more you can reduce interference and find that, you know, the better you are as a military person. So that was some of the earliest applications. But now, you know, this concept of fast Fourier transfer, signal processing is very much used in AI. So there's people now thinking about how do we use analog and digital combined? And that's kind of like the next generation of analog devices. Interesting. Can we get back to this thing? So this, this thing that China's doing, this big fund three, is this mostly for R&D? Because I don't think if this is all going to go to build foundry, right? Because they're way behind, obviously, Taiwan and the United States and even, even the Koreans when it comes to the research and development for building sophisticated, the most modern chips, yeah? Yeah, so I think it's probably worth understanding the most modern chips and what makes them different than other uh, mm -hmm. chips. So people listening to this podcast are probably familiar with the concept of Moore's Law, which was one of the first chairmen of Intel, Gordon Moore, who says, you know, every certain amount of time, like the semiconductors are actually going to be twice as complex, either twice as many um, semiconductors or process transistors that are on them, um, or they're going to process twice as much. I mean, it's, there's been different interpretations over time, because as the chips have gotten smaller and smaller, they're like, well, only compute matters, not the number of transistors, which, you know, originally it was about transistors. Yep. So how the size of transistors that are created is measured now in nanometers. And, you know, uh, as what are, we down, the to, are we down to three nanometers now? Yeah, we're anymore. down to three nanometers now. And basically, as the amount of nanometers decreases, then you run up into some of the challenges in physics, which is like, you know, you need a minimum number of atoms in order to build a transistor. So as you decrease the amount of atoms that you're using, there's more and more basically interference or quantum mechanics that changes the way that the semiconductors interact and it's harder and harder to build them. So there's a company based in the Netherlands called ASML. And for the longest time, you know, for a decade or more, they were the most advanced at creating what's called lithography systems, which is essentially using a combination of light and mirrors to make very small lasers that can etch the transistors into the wafers. Right. And, you know, they were kind of the only game in town. Like everyone would buy ASML capabilities and use it to build their core wafers. And then everything else would be built on top of that. And, you know, Intel, AMD, all these other companies that are relatively famous that we know they were all using ASML as an input. And you know, ASML is a European Netherlands based company. So they kind of sat in this place where, you know, we sell it to everyone, everyone's happy. But, you know, when 
U.S. and China are not really friendly with each other. They have to more or less take a side. And, you know, the side that they picked was the U.S. side. So there's actually this implicit or kind of explicit agreement with ASML that, you know, if there's something that goes wrong but diplomatically between China and the U.S., ASML actually has the ability to turn off their machines so the Chinese cannot operate them. So you could imagine, wow. you know, the Chinese are not super excited about this, which, you know, there was some <laughs> news coverage about that. And they need to ultimately build their own uh, lithography systems. And the interesting thing is the CHIPS Act in the U.S. also went to helping Intel build their own lithography systems. And that was some of the bigger money was to build that. So, you know, these chip companies don't want to be dependent on one supplier, and I certainly don't blame them. I don't think there's any issues with ASML's future. I mean, you know, obviously they have this embedded advantage, but some of the larger companies and kind of nation states want to um, have access to that, especially as we go from like 3 nanometer to 2 nanometer, you know, stacked uh, semiconductors that are three-dimensionally built. Wow. So, but this is recently announced. So what do we think the impact of this is actually going to be? I, I feel like the U.S. can still continue to, because the biggest worry for the U.S., right, is military technology and military intelligence and using these chips to to build that kind of stuff. But like how big an advantage does the U.S. have over China and how long do you think it takes to catch up? I mean, they have four times the population, so they should have four times the number of people that can actually do this R&D, Yeah. Yeah, I mean, my best assessment is the U.S. is like three to five years ahead. Um, but that being said, you know, let's just say China decided that Taiwan is now part of their extended country again, then their their advantage would basically go to zero. So um, <laughs> it, it all depends on, you know, how you define control over that sustainable advantage. But if you're talking about like, you know, mainland China's production capability in Shenzhen, mm -hmm versus, you know, TSMC or Intel, I would say, you know, three to five years behind, which, you know, this funding will help, definitely help close that gap. Yeah. And look, one of the things that I've learned by living out here for the last 30 something years is that China is definitely playing the long game. They really just don't care about the next three to five years at all at any level. They care more about the next 30 to 50 years. And to be fair, if they can catch up, if you look at all the Belt and Road stuff that they're doing, if you look at all the investments that they're making across Europe, Eastern Europe, and in Africa, they're playing a really long game. And at some level, they're probably going to catch up and pass the U.S. when it comes to sophisticated um, computer chip technology. It's going to be interesting well, to watch the way this goes. how I would think about it, Michael. You know, they probably have more engineers that have knowledgeable knowledge about semiconductors than the u.s can mint in a decade just because you know so much production is happening in shenzhen and they have a bigger population and like they're not that far from all the other asian supply chains coming out of korea and coming out of you know taiwan so because of that they have an inbuilt advantage to accelerate things if they need to and you know being we'll call it a coercive economy they could just force people into those jobs if they needed to yeah central planning i mean look one of the things that i learned when i was in china the first time in 1991 or 1992 i can't remember is that the chinese government just decided they were going to electrify the whole country right when they came out of the cultural revolution they just said we're going to electrify the whole country and they just did like we took trains into some of the most remote places in china and again this is 30 years ago and there were just like poles and wires everywhere i think if they put their mind to do something, they're just going to do it. Anyway. Yeah. But I think one thing for those listening that are maybe, you know, really optimistic about kind of American led security and, you know, American being the strongest country, that's actually not the most secure um, version of international relations. If you look back in history through, mm -hmm. you know, all the different configurations, so like, you know, a unipolar world with one dominant country, a bipolar world, like you think US versus USSR, or I mean, there's a lot of Britain versus France and kind of like the European errors. But the most stable form of, you know, international relations is actually a bipolar world where you have two mega powers and kind of everyone else picks sides because they all set each other. 
they offset each other. And, you know, if you're a citizen living in the world, you know, you might have preference over one or the other, but at least there's choice. So I have another thought on this and we can move on to the Jamie Dimon thing in a second, but here's another thought on this. In the 1930s and in the 1940s, right? And even in the 1950s and 1960s, when the world was kind of, as you said, bipolar, right? Two strong um, global powers and people had to pick a side. The biggest, the, I think one of the biggest things that changed since then is that like people couldn't travel back then the same way they can today. Like there was no way that people, like a guy like I was who grew up in some tiny little town in Massachusetts was going to end up living in Japan and Thailand and Hong Kong. It just wasn't possible. And what that does is, and you used to see this in Europe, right? Like the Spanish king would marry his son to the French queen, like all this kind of stuff would happen there. But now it's happening globally. So like if your wife is Chinese or if your cousin is married to somebody in Mozambique, and do you know what I mean? And if your sister is married to somebody in Korea, like you don't want to fight any of those people anymore. And that's, I think, a big change. So sure, having two big powers is, has been great historically. I think that balance is kind of changing because of all the other things in the world that has changed since then. I don't disagree with you, but I just think it's subtly different today. No? Yeah, I would generally agree with that. I mean, given um, that, you know, my wife was born in Shanghai and we're making sure we teach my son Chinese, like, you yep. know, I think yeah, you don't you don't want a war I between China and the United dynamic. States. Yeah, exactly. Definitely at not. All. But but I think more beyond that is like, you know, at least with my family, I have you know, a personal connection to want to know yeah. about both cultures as much as I can. Absolutely. I love it. I love it. Your son's just big Mandarin. That's awesome. I love it. I love it. Okay, let's do this. So there was an article that, that was entitled, Jamie Dimon is right. The number of US public companies is plummeting. I love headlines in the United States, by the way. And that's bad news for the democratic component of the economy. So I just have to preface this with, first of all, I don't understand what that means. And second of all, I sat on an equity trading desk for years. And I actually worked on multiple IPOs. So, you know, initial public offerings, making companies go public. Why do companies, why is having like more public companies a good thing? Just at well, scale, I don't understand. I think in general, it's all about access, right? So if you think your average Joe investor that, you know, has a 401k and maybe some other cash in uh, Fidelity or Schwab or, you know, Chase uh, trading account, ultimately, for more most practical purposes, their primary exposure is through, you know, bonds and through public equities. There's not... I would say the vast majority of Americans are investing in private equity unless it's through their exposure they can buy in public private equity or, you know, in they're not owning, you know, farmland, they're not owning um, raw materials, forests, things like that. So if you think about where their wealth is tied to primarily for growth, you know, it's a combination of individual stocks and you know, index funds, ETS, mutual funds. So when there's less choice, right, meaning more companies are privately held than publicly held, or there's less publicly held companies, that means that in your average Joe citizen has less access to long-term wealth creation. So in general, you know, when companies tend to stay private longer or you have less access to them, that means that the people that are more financially well-connected are going to get the benefit and upside of those private companies. You know, yep. hence one of the reasons why I'm a venture capitalist, a venture capitalist is to get access exactly. to the fastest growing companies, you know, in the insurance industry. And, you know, <laughs> if you look at how stable and how well the insurance industry is growing, you know, that's a pretty cool place to be. Yeah. So does this argue, you're going to hate me for this, but does this argue for like decentralized finance and fractalization where people can have access to even smaller and smaller pieces of whether it's private equity or like you said, venture capital, venture capital investments? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, in theory, yes. And it doesn't have to be, you know, decentralized finance in the traditional DeFi sense. But there is other startups or companies that are giving access. Like on Tuesday, we have a company called Sweater that's presenting at our event. 
And essentially, they give access to, you know, a number of different venture capital organizations that they pre-vet that, you know, average Joe investor can go on their platform and, and buy and, you know, they don't have to, you know, run a VC themselves or be hyper connected. They can leverage the benefit of Sweater. There's another company called Allocate that does a similar type of thing. Um, and there's a few robo advisors that are kind of incorporating we'll call it um, non-traditional or alternative assets into their model. But to your point, Michael, like if DeFi enabled it so, you know, you could issue ownership in your company in a very efficient, modern way, then yeah. sure, I'm all for that. I mean, it creates the same impact ultimately. Do I think, you know, ICOs were the right option and like, you know, every company no. should have a coin? No, no, but, you know, there's other ways to do it. Yeah, I mean, fractionalization doesn't necessarily mean that every company has to have a coin. It just means that their the ownership structure should be on a blockchain or on a distributed ledger piece of technology. You can use Solana, like it doesn't matter, but that you can buy things in smaller and smaller increments. One of the one of the biggest issues, and I was talking to a woman named Micah Doyer, who runs something called Epic Angels in Singapore. They have three hundred female investors on their platform globally, and one of the things that Micah was arguing for was to change the rules and restrictions around who can like what your net worth actually has to be to invest in private equity and startup companies, because it's too high still. There's two restrictions or challenges in the US. One is like, you know, pending some other um, ways to go about it. Generally, you can only have, you know, 99 individual investors that are not qualified purchasers. And for those who are right. not familiar, you know, there's a few different tiers in the US. There is accredited investor, which is a million dollars in net worth not including the value of equity in your home. Um, there's other ways to qualify, but that's a primary. And then there's qualified purchasers, which is basically like 5 million in liquid assets. So, you know, there's no real restriction on qualified purchasers, the number, but usually you can only have like 99 in credit investors in a specific investment vehicle. So I think one way to fix it is, you know, change that 99 to 999. Yeah, Another way like to fix that as you said, you know, you could change the restrictions of what it means to be a uh, accredited investor, where maybe you just take a test, you prove that you're competent enough with managing your finances. People have also talked about like just having, you know, 10% of your net worth as yeah, another yeah. rule. So yep. either of those, I think are legitimate. Do we want, you know, we'll call it the, the Gen Z's YOLOing their money on insure techs, you know, <laughs> probably not. I mean, that would be great to have some more investors in the space, but I <laughs> for think you would they be great, be, you know, prudent. Yeah, I don't want people yoloing their money. <laughs> Please, let's not do that again. Okay, let's talk about flight insurance. This is something you mentioned to me before we started recording. I don't live in the United States, and I have not lived there in thirty something years. And to be honest. The airport and the flight experiences that I have, even after COVID opened up, like I think I fly into the greatest airports in the whole world. Singapore, literally from the moment I get off the plane to the time I get into the taxi, it's probably like seven minutes. And the immigration is completely automated. And the guys and gals that work in the immigration part of the Singapore airport are just like the most apologetic and polite people you've ever met. I feel like they should be working at Montrachet as opposed to working at the airport. These are the greatest people in the whole world. What is this experience like in the United States? You know, so to say the U.S. has one uh, experience flying in one airline is probably an unfair characterization. But I would say sure. compared to, you know, some of the experiences I've had in Asia or Europe, generally, you know, customer service in U.S. airports is pretty poor. I mean, some airports are definitely better than others. But, you know, some airports you go and you think, wow, geez, this is an American uh, airport. And like, you know, I, I can't even figure out with the signs how to get to the right terminal. There's like right. not even enough food that if I had to be there for the whole day, I couldn't avoid eating fast food. You know, there's some pretty crappy experiences. I mean, there's some um, airports in the U.S. that like are small enough. They don't even have, you know, one single airline club. So you have to rough it out with everyone else. But, you know, jokes aside, <laughs> David, I would say 
what I've observed over the last five years is, yeah. you know, the best time ever to be flying. And I was fortunate to be a little bit, we'll call it naive then, is flying <laughs> during COVID. You know, if you flew, let's call it June of 2020, which I think I took maybe one flight then to visit some relatives on the other side of the country. Right. It was amazing. Like I flew Delta, the middle seat was open, the right. airport was empty. You know, people just didn't want to talk to you just to avoid any contact. It was great. Um, but, you know, post COVID, there have been overpacking planes. You know, I was just on a flight to San Francisco and back. And, you know, instead of flying the normal 737s, they put us on, I think it was like a 767 or 777 one yeah. with the four middle seats. And, you know, it was like 90 plus percent full. And, um, you know, that's unreasonable for a, a, a random Tuesday to Friday flight to San Francisco out of Newark, you know? So I think, you know, there's not enough um, planes that are being used. The customer service is getting worse and worse. And what the U.S. has that a lot of other countries don't have is really crappy budget airlines. So Spirit, Frontier, um, you know, there's a, there's a few others that fit in that category. And basically what you get for that is a seat with zero leg room. You have to pay extra for water. I'm surprised they don't charge you extra to go to the bathroom. Um, but you're <laughs> they, more they or less oxygen. Like, yeah, you're more or less, you know, cattle in a cattle car. So to that extent, you know, passing some form of legislation that says, you know, by the way, if your flight gets canceled, you have a right to get your money back yeah. is a beautiful thing, which I know that law or similar laws exist in the EU. And I think if we can get it, something passed in the US, at the very least to know the what's going to happen over the fate of your ticket, because most of these budget airlines, you have to pay extra for the ability to cancel or change your flight. Right. So more or less, you know, it's it's non-refundable in every possible way, even if they screw it up. And I think I get it. Like people know what they're getting into, but it should be non-refundable in every possible way, with the exception if they screw it up, you should get your money back. But so this is new legislation that's being proposed and almost passing in the United States, right? Like, I don't know where it sits in the House of Representatives in the Senate. I'm sure if it gets to the president's um, desk, he'll sign it. And I've done some reading on this. But is this a parametric experience? And, and if it is, here's the other thing I want to ask, Rex. Right, I don't know how it works in the U.S. Is there one wallet that everybody has where this can digitally go into? Does it go digitally into your bank account? Like, how does the, how does the whole process work or how is it meant to work? So based on the legislation, it's supposed to be parametric. In Europe, it's not. You have to fill out a form and then get reimbursed. And they have a certain period of time to do that. Huh. Um but, you know, I think if they could make it parametric, that would be amazing. That's what the legislation says. But I have no idea how they're going to implement it, given that, you know, airplanes take every way of payment from using points to credit cards to debit cards to yeah. probably some of them even take ACH. Never heard Do of anyone really? buying a plane ticket with a check, though. <laughs> Not anymore. But do you think this thing's going to pass? I sure hope it does. I think any legislator that's flown on the plane in the last five years, which is probably all of them because they have to go yeah. back and forth to D.C., is probably rooting for it. But I think this is really a question of how how strong the big three airlines in the U.S. are can lobby against it, right? You know, it's unfortunate, but really United, Delta, and American Airlines have like the majority of the flight legs in most airports. So they have a lot of power and this is really a question of like how how much influence they have i was talking to a company in an insure tech in europe i think it was called koala right ugo whale I, I can't remember exactly how to pronounce his name but i'm sure i'm butchering it but i think that they were they were started this whole thing on flight insurance that if you if your flight got canceled or flight got changed or whatever they had a parametric product i think that would pay you back if i have this right yeah there is a bunch of insure techs that are in some variation of you know flight delay or cancellation coverage yeah. aig is a big player in that but you know beyond that there's a bunch that do you know travel medical or all the other things that get messed up like weather promise is one of the yeah. ones where unrelated to the airlines but you know if it's a shitty weather trip when you get there 
they will, you know, give you some money back. I mean, this is kind of, it's not really off topic, but like, what's your view on parametric insurance as, as a product category? Like, I feel like I've been talking about this for the last three or four years. I feel like everybody wants to do this really well, but is this something that's happening in the U S and in Europe from your experience at scale? Very slowly. So if you think about it, there's a reason for that because there's a reason for a, a regular claims process, right? A claims process usually has three steps. One, identifying that the claim happened, which in the U.S. is called first notice of loss. Yep. You know, determining FNLL. whether it's a valid claim and then figuring out how much the payout is, right? So for parametric insurance, I think logically there's some claims where you don't need to figure out how much the payout is because it's a some certain amount and you agree upon that at the beginning of the insurance so from that perspective that's great but from the other two perspectives i think there's a lot of use cases where it doesn't make sense to automatically yeah. determine whether the claim happened or not right like it's never going to happen with an, an auto accident because a few things. One, sometimes someone might, you know, crash into their own, um, let's call it garage door or, you know, right. a barrier, a mailbox. Uh, right. And, um, you know, you might not want to report that claim because it's embarrassing and it's also less than your deductible. On the other side, figuring out the some certain value of the claim in auto is definitely not going to work, especially if you have to go to an auto repair shop to figure that out. But this like middle piece of, you know, figuring out if it's covered or not, I think that's where parametric adds a ton of value Yeah, is that if they have automated digitized ways to do that, they just cut so much cost out of the claims process. So in the cases where this can be done, right? Like there's a company in New York called Rick and their whole idea is they want to cover flood. So if you have, you know, I think it's, they told the founder, Nikita told me 99% of US counties have had, you know, a flood just by regular rainfall in the last, you know, several decades. And if they can determine exactly how much rainfall happened in the given location where your house is or where your right. asset is, then that's very valuable. And I think it solves a lot of time, energy, and effort that goes into that process. So that's where I think the value of parametric is. Does it have to be paid out immediately or in 24 hours? No. But if they can reduce that whole adjudication process or determination process, that's where I think, you know, we need to have more parametric insurance in almost every area. So what's your view? And uh, we'll move on to the next topic in a second. What's your view on para indemnity where something happens, it's automated, the data processing is automated. So you get a small claim automatically. And then the, the indemnity part of it where you the larger claim could possibly happen is not as automated, but like, you know, if your house burns down, you're going to need money to go live in a hotel kind of thing. So maybe you get 10 grand or 30 grand or whatever it is. And then the million dollars or 500 grand it takes to rebuild your house, you then have to go through this process of like <clears throat> validation and, and then figuring out the amount as well. No, I think these are some of the best use cases. I mean, we had a company in our MGA lab called Sola and they do, you know, parametric tornado insurance, but just for the deductible. So tornado hits your house, right? And, you know, this is assuming your house isn't reduced to rubble, but like all right. the windows are out and you have meaningful damage. You want to start repairing the windows and not everyone, let's say you have a bigger deductible, 10 or 15 grand, has that ready to go so then they can get the contractors. And in this case with a tornado, there's going to be so much demand for contractors. So if you could be on the phone the next day calling them up, it's a huge advantage that you have and that, you know, Sola gets you. So it actually helps the primary insurer because the total cost of recovery it's is less. And lower, yeah. you know, the person's going to be happy that they get, you know, a check in 24 or 48 hours. Okay. Let's, let's end on on some legal issues <laughs> how much do you want to talk about how much do you want to talk about the law so in the last what five or six weeks i don't know how long this trial has been going on but the former president of the united states of america a guy named donald trump maybe you've heard of him you're a new yorker right so maybe you've heard of him um was on trial and was just um found guilty of 34 counts of who knows what and the other thing that's happening though he was the former president 
But now you have Hunter Biden, and if you hadn't pointed it out to me, I would not have known this, actually. Is also going on trial, and so jury is going to be selected, and stuff like that is happening, what, over the next week or so? I would not have known that if you hadn't mentioned it to me. To be fair for me, and again, I don't live in the United States, although I am a U.S. citizen, I do vote in important elections. Hunter Biden's not an elected official. He's never ran for office. He has no particular power. His father, even though has probably less money than Mitch McConnell, who's been in the Senate for his entire life. And I know Joe Biden was the youngest elected senator and the oldest elected president, and the oldest sitting president. But like, it's weird for a guy like that to not have like a billion dollars in the bank due to just like all the normal grift that happens in any government, not just in the U.S., but globally. Why is this Hunter Biden thing even important? I mean, except for the fact that I would say it kind of proves the point that the justice system or the existing Justice Department is not necessarily biased if they're trying to adjudicate something with the son of the president. Like, why does this thing matter at all? Yeah, so there's actually two charges against Hunter Biden right now. Um, the one, you know, coming up with jury selection in a week or so is a gun related charge, which I'll explain a little more on. Then the yeah, other yeah. one, which I think is happening in September, is a tax evasion uh, related charge. So two separate ones, two separate issues. But I think, you know, the most immediate one probably worth talking about a little bit is the gun charges. So the gist of it is um, Hunter Biden um, is being charged or it's claimed or alleged that, you know, he lied on a form that you have to fill out in order to get a firearm. And essentially right. on the form, one of the things you have to say is, you know, you're not addicted to drugs. And, <laughs> you know, he's, this is a guy who's been in and out of rehab yep. and there's a substantial amount of evidence um, that, you know, the prosecution is going to bring to bear that, you know, he was addicted to drugs during the period of time when he filled out the application and got the firearm. So, I mean, I think a lot of people don't really understand in the United States, like how easy it is to get guns. And, you know, certain states are easier than others. I mean, some states, it's as easy as you literally go to a gun show, bring money and buy it. Um, you know, many states have a waiting period where, you know, you don't want to be angry person, go buy a gun. They usually make you wait, you know, a week or, or longer period of time. Sounds like a good idea. Yeah, but, you know, there are some, but not all states that have, you know, protections against people with mental health issues. And, you know, in this case, you know, the state that yeah. under Biden was living in at the time had a restriction that you can't be addicted to drugs and have a firearm or purchase a firearm. Sounds fair so, to me as well. Yeah. So, I mean, the charges are pretty logical of why they're being put on and if anything, to your point, Michael, this kind of proves that the justice system in the U.S. is relatively independent of politics. And, yep. you know, whatever prosecutor is going after it is trying to do it in the kind of good faith of maintaining the laws of the U.S. And if anything, you know, this should have a good or positive effect on other people that are addicted to drugs that decided they want to purchase firearms or, you know, acquire them by other means. So this was being prosecuted, I think, like a year or two ago by a guy named David Weiss, right, who was appointed by, I can't remember, was this a Trump appointment? Like, I don't even remember who it was. And they were going to settle this case. I remember, right? And then for some yeah, reason, some so technicality, they, originally they didn't. had a plea bargain yep. um, and that was being negotiated last summer. And then, you know, it just, they couldn't get to an agreement. Something like that. Okay. Is there anything else that's significant going on in this case or no? I think just one thing to be aware of is, you know, given that his father is the president, he has yep. the ability to do one of two things, either essentially strike um the the charges after they're given so he doesn't have any responsibility or what's called commute the sentence so he can kind of reduce it so if he was supposed to go to jail he can say okay uh you don't go to jail so i think that's what makes it political is that you know you have a president who's the father of a son who's being charged for a crime that he has the ability to essentially you know make as if it didn't happen and um you know the president has said he's not going to use that power. But I mean, any normal person thinking about their child going to jail, 
I would say, you know, why would you not use that power if it was in your ability? So my guess is that, you know, if he gets, he becomes guilty and Biden is still the president, that he probably will use that power, which comes into the question, just that whole political aspect of it. But overall, I would say, you know, the fact this is happening is probably means like the U.S. justice system is relatively healthy. Um, but just like any other country, there there's sometimes politics that comes across when, you know, we'll call it powerful people are, you know, going after for legal issues. Let's just end on this note. Like anytime there are humans involved, no matter what, how strong the system is, there are going to be imperfections. Let's just leave it at that. Yeah. And I think that's true everywhere in the world in every kind of system that gets set up by humans, because you're right. The more power, maybe the more money you have, depending on how those things are equivalent, the more likely there are to be like loopholes for people to get through. Anyway, I can't yeah. wait for... I can't wait for next month, David. Who knows what's going to happen in June? I know. All I have to say is you know, June is supposed to be like, at least in the U.S., a, a summer relaxing month. But, you know, who knows? It could be a, a, a wild and crazy month with all kinds of news stories. But all I have to say is like go, going back to the beginning with the chip sack, you know, the fact that the entire world is investing in semiconductors should leave us on a pretty optimistic note Yeah, that, you know, eventually we will have better technologies to make our lives better. And, you know, I'm perfectly fine with some of my taxpayer dollars and Chinese taxpayer dollars going to, you know, making better technology. Yeah, I mean, uh, you're right. I want to end on a really positive note as well. In the long arc of history, improved technology over time has always made human lives better. Always. Anyway, David, thanks for doing this. Like I said at the beginning, I look forward to this every single month. Every time it actually finally goes in the calendar after you and I going back, is Tuesday okay? How about Friday? How about Thursday? You want to do Saturday? <laughs> I'm busy on Monday. Like After all of that, once it's in the calendar, I love it. Thanks again for doing this, man. Welcome.